we had to switch from the teacher's room down to the basement where we have a little more of a whiteboard because unfortunately this is going to be a little bit longer. So if we talk about the tea test once again, right, we have three types of tea tests, or I like to call three flavors, one sample, independent and dependent tea test. So when can we actually use the tea test? Remember I said it was the approximate Z test. In reality, we have less information known of the population, like when we're presenting a new product onto the population. So then we have to have a couple of things that we have to keep in mind. When should you actually run a t-test as opposed to running a z-test? It's not just an unknown standard deviation for a population. It's also a couple different things. So there's actually going to be specifically five different assumptions. And in statistics, they're actually called assumptions, or maybe you can call them in your brain requirements or criteria, whichever one's easier for you to understand. But they're actually pretty much called assumptions. If you were to Google it, you would Google them as assumptions for any of the particular tests that we would talk about throughout this semester or our classes. So the first one when we're thinking about it, when we're talking about the t-test, we have to keep in mind that we have to make sure that we have random sampling. So simple random sampling. So in other words, the way you collect the data should hopefully be a simple random sample. You're not going to go out there and say, hey guys, let me post something on Facebook and help everyone answers your link on Facebook. That's more like voluntary sampling. You're not going to go out there either and say, okay, I'm a professor of statistics and I want to ask about anxiety levels of stat students and I'm going to ask all of my students if they would participate in my survey. Asking all my students to participate is more like a convenient sample. So in reality, it's not simple random sampling. Something like a random sampling would say, I want to understand the anxiety level of all stat students at my university who are all freshmen. You'd go over to the registrar's office and have them pull a list of you of all of the students who fit the criteria of your population. When you actually give every single person equal opportunity to be part of your research because they fit the criteria of your population and then randomly select from that list, like every third person, every fifth person, and randomly send an email out inviting all of them to be part of your research, then you're actually having something like a simple random sample or simply a random sample if you invite every single person that's part of the identified population to be part of your research. And in a university, that could be, let's say, 2,000 students. Identifying all of them and inviting them all to be part of it is now simple random sampling, as opposed to something like voluntary, everyone volunteering on Facebook, or convenient because you have a readily accessible population or sample to actually test from because they're like your students, like in my case. So we have something called simple random sampling. We also have to keep in mind that we have the scale of measurement. So the scale of measurement has to do, right? With the type of data we're using. In this instance, we're gonna use scale data. The reason I call it scale is because if you use SPSS, it's basically interval or ratio data. What is the difference between interval or ratio data? Data that produces numbers like your age, your weight, your income, your GPA, that's all interval or ratio data. The difference is, is that ratio data has an absolute zero. So if you were talking about data specifically like age, can you go below the age of zero in age? Now, when you're born, you're a minute, a second, three days old. You never go below it. So that's ratio data. But when you think about something like temperature, can you go below zero in temperature? You can. You can have like negative 30 as a temperature, meaning it's freaking cold, right? So you can go below zero. That's interval data. So data that produces numbers that can either have an absolute zero or no zero are actually called scale data in SPSS. Or you have ordinal data. Ordinal data is ranking. So think about ranking data, like if you're talking about first place, second place, third place, college, sophomore, junior, senior. So when you're talking about ranking, that's ordinal data. So data that's going to produce some type of statistical rank or it's going to produce some type of interval ratio are the ones that are used in the t-test. You will not use nominal data, which is essentially categories. You can't cut in half a gender or cut in half a child. You can't have a two and a half family members or you can't have two and a half genders. It wouldn't make sense because you're either male or female, sexually and biologically, right? Or you're simply a family that has two kids or three kids, never half a kid, even if you're pregnant. So if we talk about simple random sampling, we talk about scale of measurement, we also have to keep in mind that there's a couple different assumptions. The other most important assumption is keeping in mind the idea that it will make a normal distribution. 
So a normal distribution means that when you actually go out and correct those samples, the samples are going to be a normal distribution. How do we ensure we have a normal distribution? We have large samples. So remember, I talked about that in the previous video saying that we had to have large samples. Having too much of a small sample will not lead to an actual normal distribution or that bell curve that we all know of. And the last one is something called homogeneity of variances. If we talk about homogeneous samples, homogeneous samples means the fact that they're the same internally. So all males, all females are all chaotic and all chaotic, right? We want to make sure that they're all the same. This really holds true more than the one sample. It holds true in the independent and the dependent, but more specifically, the independent t-test. Because large samples, all of them should have large samples. Normal distribution, all of them. Scale of measurement, the type of data used, all of them. Random sampling, all. But this particular one, homogeneity of variances, really talks about this. If we're talking about, let's say, male and female. Can you compare two groups that are internally different? In reality, you shouldn't. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's say we were talking about the idea if they love chocolate ice cream, right? Chocolate versus strawberry or just some type of ice cream flavor. If we were talking about ice cream and we were saying, okay, all of the males love chocolate ice cream. So we say, let's plot all of the males. And we end up forming a distribution that looks like this. Pretty normal. And then we form a distribution of the females and we have this in the middle, it's skewed, which means it's shifted. They're not internally the same. This group right here has the average, let's say, right, chocolate lover. The average level of chocolate love on a scale of one to five, let's say it's a three. And the majority either fall a little bit above it or a little bit below it, either 3.5, a three, a four, a two, you're really close around the three in your level of intensity of love of chocolate. But the women, right, because we know we're women, we love chocolate. So the women, in terms of their chocolate lover, right, they're above a three. The majority of them are above a three. There's a little bit of people who are less than a three, which means the majority are probably a three, a four, even five in their extreme. These two groups are internally different. So how are you going to measure groups that are internally different? And so when it actually runs the test, it talks about homogeneity of variances. It talks about what's going on amongst the two groups and can the two groups be compared? Easy way to understand, chaos and happiness. Can you compare a group that is chaotic to a group that's happy? No, because they won't be able to make up their minds and they can. And that's what homogeneity of variance is tested. And when you're looking at it in SPSS, it's called Levine's test. Levine's test is what runs before you actually run the independent t-test. It actually first tests, are the groups internally the same? And can they be compared? And so it'll tell you, is there a significant difference amongst the groups? If there is, you'll read the top line. And if there isn't, you'd read the bottom line. Essentially, when you look at the t-test on SPSS, it'll give you two outputs for the t, when they are significantly and when they are not significantly different. And so that's when people sometimes look at the independent t-test on SPSS, they tend to get confused because they don't first think about the assumptions, what is required to run the test. And specifically inside of the independent t-test, this fifth assumption is keeping in mind that the groups should be internally different. I mean, sorry, they should be internally the same, right? And if they are not internally the same, and meaning they are different, then they should actually not be compared. So now what we're going to do is we're going to think about now to looking at an example of each one of these and how you would actually go on to conduct a hypothesis test using all four steps in our next video.